once again, hello everyone. Welcome to um, Inland Software's webinar titled Risk Management and FMEA in Software and Hardware Projects. My name is Christoph Horvat. Um, I work with the marketing team here at Inland Software, and I will be your host today during, uh, during the webinar, along with my colleague Shandor Sabo, who will be responsible for uh, the live demonstration of Code Deemer's relevant features. All right, so first off, a few words about today's uh, agenda. First, we will be discussing the basics of managing risks in, uh, in software and hardware development projects, answering questions such as why risk mitigation is important at all and how it can be managed efficiently. And then uh, I'm going to outline a general risk management lifecycle applicable to both hardware and software development. Uh, following that, I will also talk about failure mode and effects analysis, commonly known as FMEA which is a widely used method to support uh, risk management. And then I will briefly showcase the relevant features of Codebeam ALM and explain how these could help you streamline and ensure the efficiency of your risk mitigation processes. Right, so um, after the presentation and the live demonstration, you will get a chance to ask all your questions during a questions and answer session. But in the meantime, please feel free to use the questions box on your control plan panel to ask any questions. Please note that a recording of today's webinar will be available on the Inland website soon after, uh, after the session today. And once you're there, when you're visiting our events page, please make sure that you take a look at our upcoming events and uh, webinars and conferences. And feel free to sign up for any of these events. Uh, in February, you will find us at Embedded Meets Agile, Embedded World, and Reconf. Now, if you would like to join the Embedded World conference for free, make sure that you sign up for our newsletter because we, we will be giving away free voucher code uh, to redeem on the event's website. All right, so moving on, just a few words about Intel Software. The company was founded in uh, 1998 and is based in Stuttgart, Germany. But we also have partners in Korea and Taiwan and an office in the Silicon Valley in the US. We are the developers and the only vendors of Codebeamer ALM, which is a fully integrated and complete application lifecycle management solution. Now, Intland is also providing consulting and services from Germany with the mission to help our clients manage the complexity of their elaborate product and, and application development processes. We will, I'm going to show you a short list of our, of our clients. As you can see, we are serving customers from various industries, such as the automotive and medical device development, uh, the defense and, and finance sectors, as well as high-tech uh, development companies involved in embedded and IoT development. Now, Inland Software has clients ranging from mid-sized companies to large global enterprises, such as uh, Siemens, Lufthansa, and, and Samsung, for example, you can see here. All right, so that's about the interactions for today, and let's move on to our main topic today. First off, let's start with the basics, definitions. So risks in development projects are defined as uncertainty that matters. Now, obviously, uncertainty should be minimized in any project, any development project, especially those complex projects that involve both hardware and software development. Because any small deviation from the original plan, whether in terms of the scheduled timeframes or the budgeted costs, could have disastrous consequences and could really gravely affect the success of the entire development project. Now, it's important to differentiate between product or functional risks, meaning that the, pro the end product itself doesn't fit the, the requirements or it is not functioning in any way, and project risks, on the other hand, which could result in overhead for your development project. So in other words, your end product itself may be considered successful if it works safely and, and reliably, but if developing it costs twice the budgeted amount, then the project itself would be viewed as a failure, even though the product works. Now, while it makes sense to make this distinction when discussing the theory of risks and risk management, using the adequate processes that we will be introducing later in the webinar could help you mitigate both types of risks, both functional and, and project risks. Functional risks are actually generally viewed as more severe and are especially important in, in safety-critical development projects. 
These safety or mission critical devices are used in, in various applications where the lives of people may depend on the correct, correct functioning of these, these products. And therefore, their development is regulated by rigorous guidelines and standards in order to make sure that they work safely and reliably over extended periods of time. Now, while the standards that apply may vary greatly depending on what industry you're looking at, what industry you're developing uh, products for, there are certain general regulations and guidelines that are um, good to keep. So, for example, traceability and, and adequate risk management. Risk management is is especially required by almost all of these regulations, regardless of what sector they apply to. And it's generally not a bad idea to borrow methods and, and processes from, from the companies uh, that operate in the safety critical industries uh, that have to comply with all these standards, because process quality is obviously a number one concern for them. And using the right processes could really reduce your risks. So there is no shame in looking at these expert companies, even if your requirements about risk management are not as strict as their requirements are. In addition to potentially saving human lives, uh, risk management is also beneficial for the companies uh, that work on these products. For example, in the automotive and medical industries, an increasing number of product recalls is harming the, uh, the profitability of these uh, development companies. In addition to that, it's worth mentioning the, the adverse effects uh, that a recall or any malfunctioning of their products could have on the reputation of these companies. And therefore, it's safe to say that risk management is a crucial process for all of these uh, safety critical companies. In addition to that, the benefits of risk management include shortening the time to market of the product, increasing product quality, and ensuring the reliability and the safety of, um, of the product. So how do these companies make sure that they use the right processes to manage risks and what kind of methods and, and tools do they use to, uh, to implement these risk management measures? Now, before we move on to uh, the software tools, discussing the, the tools and, and platforms that could help risk management, let's find out more about the, the processes that companies operating in the safety critical development um, use. So basically, in general, it's important to know that uh, the later you catch your issues, the more expensive it's going to be for you to fix them. So in other words, identifying risks as early as possible is important. Right, so how exactly does risk management work? Well, generally, your risk management efforts will follow this life cycle. As you can see, <clears throat> the process begins with identifying your risks and determining what hazards your product could potentially contain. This means that you have to collect all the potential risks and analyzing them to find out more about First, their probability, so in other words, how likely these risks are to occur. And second, their severity, so how much trouble these risks could cause if and once they do occur. Now, you may also include an extra aspect, that of detecting the issue. So whether there are any controls in place to detect or control these risks, and if so, how long does it take for, for these controls to uncover the risk once it has uh, occurred? So basically, how long it's going to take you or or the user to realize that there's something going wrong. And then you will obviously need to investigate your options to reduce and possibly mitigate all these risks. Now, it's important to know that you'll also have to keep an eye out for any further risks that may be introduced by your risk mitigation actions. So basically, you will need to manage the risks of your risk management efforts as well. And this is where it gets really complicated. And last, of course, in order to ensure compliance with standards and regulations, if this applies for your field, you will have to document and report on all your risk mitigation processes and efforts, all the mitigation actions carried out throughout the life cycle. A lot of methods and, and techniques and software tools are used to implement this risk management life cycle in practice, as it tends to get really complicated, and Codebeam Ray LM is actually one of these tools. It offers a comprehensive risk management tool set, which you can rely on to manage your hazards. It's also important that Risk management differs greatly in software and hardware projects. Usually in hardware development, um, a quantitative approach is applied. And this approach relies on statistical analysis, sample data techniques, and random sampling techniques to understand the causes and, and all the effects of these risks and how likely these risks are to occur. With software components, developers usually don't have access to that kind of data. So that's uh, the main difference between hardware and software risk management. Now, while Codebeam Ray LM is by nature a platform that supports software development, 
Its basic objective is actually to help you manage complexity. Therefore, integrating and managing your hardware risk data in CodeBeamer could help you manage all your product risks in one place in an integrated manner, whether they are related to software or hardware. So let's first take a look at CodeBeamer's general risk management capabilities, and then we'll move on to a useful method called FMEA, or Failure Mode and Effects Analysis, that could help you manage your risks uh, adequately. Right, well, as you will see in the live demonstration, CodeBeamer ALM offers various features and capabilities around, around risk management. So basically, when using CodeBeamer, you can configure your ALM's artifacts to suit your custom internal processes. Whatever kind of processes you use, uh, CodeBeamer will be able to accommodate those. The whole system is really flexible, as you will see. You can set up dedicated risk trackers to manage your hazards throughout the entire lifecycle, and you can also link them to other work items. So for instance, when addressing a risk with an action, let's say a task, the requirement created for this task could actually create a new risk automatically, and all these risks created automatically will, will be automatically interlinked in CodeBeamer. Links are going to be established. So just to give you an example to make it easier to understand, let's say that in order to fix a risk, say uh, a potentially malfunctioning user interface, you will have to develop a new component. In this example, let's say that you will need a safety check for the user interface. Now, the safety check is a new component, and it could itself introduce new risks, new risks to your product. And therefore, establishing the links between these items is necessary in order for you to be able to cover all of the risks with reduction measures. Obviously, this also gives you full traceability throughout the entire lifecycle allowing you to trace back the features of safety components to initial requirements on all of their risks. And this gives you an idea about, first of all, why certain features are included in the product, and second, what has been done to ensure the safety and the reliability of, of all these features. So CodeBeamer also lets you specify and automate complex workflows uh, to manage your risks. And these allow you to set up the automatic creation of risk trackers if certain conditions are met. Once again, a simple example, if a requirement is given a high risk rating, if it's considered um, a high risk requirement, then you can configure CodeBeamer to automatically create a risk item for this and link it to the initial requirement. So as soon as a requirement gets a high risk rating, you also have a requirement. Therefore, the chance of human error is significantly decreased. And you can also add guards and e-signatures to make sure that only those authorized members of your team uh, who are allowed can change or, or verify your risks. Obviously, all changes to your risk items and, and requirements and all those the, all the other work items will be automatically recorded and documented, which provides complete change control and transparency throughout the entire lifecycle. With CodeBeamer, no change ever goes unnoticed as you will be able to see timestamped records of what has been changed, by whom, um, and possibly even why, if they have uh, provided a comment about why they have changed certain things. Documents with full change history and even custom reports may be simply exported to uh, Microsoft Office documents, which facilitates collaboration and compliance with standards, and as collaboration internally or with external stakeholders. All right, so among other processing and techniques, one of the most widely used risk management methods is failure mode or effects analysis, which is commonly referred to as FMEA. And this technique follows the life cycle we have outlined before on one of our previous slides. It is basically an inductive system safety engineering method uh, for risk or failure mode analysis. Now, in a nutshell, just in short, FMEA requires you to list all your potential failure modes. So that is all the risks uh, that pertain to your product analyze their likelihood and severity, as well as detection ratings or controls, and plan the mitigation actions that aim to reduce your general risk level. Now, based on your likelihood, severity, and detection ratings or values, another value called risk priority number uh, can be calculated and is in fact calculated by CodeMeaver automatically, which gives you a priority list of, um, of your most severe issues. This RPN combined with the risk matrix diagram uh, actually gives you a really nice overview of all your risks and helps you reduce your hazards. Now here it's, a, it's really important to mention that you cannot get rid of all your risks. 
So however thorough you are in your risk management efforts, some level of risk is going to be present in your end product. Now, some experts claim that calling this an acceptable risk level is not a good idea, as no level of risk can be considered acceptable, which may be true, we can agree with that, but whether or not you call it acceptable, you will have to face the fact that some level of risk is going to be present in your product. You cannot have zero, zero risks. So either way, uh, you will need to have a perfectly clear overview of all your risks, and this is what FMEA can help you with. Codebeamer offers a comprehensive uh, FMEA template that guides you through the entire process of conducting the analysis. And with an exportable FMEA worksheet, this tool is really helpful in orchestrating your risk management efforts throughout the entire product lifecycle. And what's more, uh, it also has a risk matrix diagram, which gives you an efficient overview of uh, your product's general risk level. Now, one last thing that is important to note about FMEA is that it's a general risk management method. And while it's really useful, uh, it's definitely not a standalone risk management procedure. So conducting FMEA uh, will help you a great deal in orchestrating your risk management efforts and making sure they are um, efficient. But FMEA is not sufficient on its own. You will need to check any standards that you're seeking compliance with, and you will have to create your own custom lifecycle around risks. Right, so next uh, we're going to take a look at how exactly risk management works out in practice and how FMEA can be conducted efficiently to guide your risk management measures. So we'll start a live demo to show you how CodeBeamer could support your and streamline your risk management lifecycle. But before we do that, um, I would like to ask you a few real simple questions. Let me go over to... First one, obviously, real simple. What kind of tools you're using currently? Yeah, I consider the majority of, uh, of our attendees use Microsoft Office tools. Well, you will see that uh, there, are, there are better options <laughs> during the live demo. Right, thank you for your answers. Two more real simple questions. Um, first one is what kind of tool you're searching for, if you're searching for any kind of tool at the moment. Okay, thank you so much for your answers. And the last one is what software development methodology you're using in your development efforts. <clears throat> All right, thank you so much. So we're going to um, move on with the live demonstration. Let me hand it over to Chandor Sabo, who will be conducting the demo. Chandor, I think you're still muted. I'm Chandor. Ah, oh, there you go. OK, now it should be OK. Okay, hello, I'm Shandor Sabo from Intland Software, and I would like to provide a live demonstration about our failure mode and effect analysis template, project template, uh, which was created to provide a base of working for those who are using failure mode and effects analysis in their work. So in this template, uh, the failure modes are uh, and the properties and the workflows of the failure modes are collected into a tracker, which is called failure mode, not surprisingly. Uh, here in the system requirements tracker, you can see the requirements of the system, and the failure modes are collected to the requirements, so, that, so it means that each requirement can have one or more failure modes. And these failure modes are collected in the failure modes tracker. 
just before going forward, I would like to tell you that this tracker and the entire um, project template is completely customizable and flexible so that you can uh, customize it to fit your needs uh, and I will demonstrate it uh, a little bit later. So, first let's see how much we can customize tracker and what are the possibilities. So, you can customize first of all the permissions for your tracker. It's a generic tracker uh, feature that uh, you can customize who can access uh, your items and tracker and how. In the horizontal axis you can see the roles of your project that you define and in the vertical axis you can see the different permission uh, about the tracker and by uh, ticking checkbox, checking or unchecking them, you can control the permissions. So that's the first possibility. Second is uh, customizing the workflow of the failure modes or any other tracker, but now let's talk about the failure mode tracker. So uh, customizing the workflow means that you can change uh, the possible statuses that the failure modes can uh, take and you can change the transitions between the failure modes. So here you can see that the basic workflow of the failure modes, that when you define a failure mode, failure mode, it will arrive to the new status. From the new, it can go to verified, from verified uh, uh, to actions planned, and from actions planned to actions taken and then to done. Of course, you can go back from done to verified by the reopen, uh, uh, transition and there are many different transitions which uh, provides the possibility to traverse the workflow and uh, all of these are completely customizable for example by clicking on a transition you can uh, change from which status to which status the transition goes transition name permissions of the transition you can define condition guards and actions so you can customize it pretty much. And also you can uh, remove statuses and add new statuses. So that's about, that's, that is about state transitions. You can also uh, customize the fields that belong to a tracker and that belongs to this failure mode tracker too. So here you can see the list of the fields. Uh, you can remove any fields that are not used by the system. Uh, there are certain fields which are system fields and they cannot be removed, but all the others, you can remove them. You can change the permissions, change the properties of the field. You can change the, the, the layout and content, the computation rules, mandatory property, service desk properties, and the other properties of your field. And you can also add new fields and at the bottom of the page, you can add new choice field, new custom field, which can be many type. Let's see if you click on new custom field. Here you can see the types. It can be text, integer, decimal, date, and the others, many others, Boolean, language, country, and so on. Uh, so you can add new fields. You can define the permission uh, of the field, and we have three permission models. The first is you can see unrestricted, you can add unrestricted permission to the field. You can have a single permission, uh, which is, uh, which you can see here. Uh, this single permission is applied to each statuses. And you can choose the per status permission model, in which you define the permission for each status. So you, by this way you can completely customize uh, the FME, the failure mode uh, tracker. And finally, we have a risk management related uh, feature uh, in the customization of the failure mode tracker because this is a risk type tracker and in case of risk type trackers, uh, a risk management tab also appears in the customization page. And this uh, on this uh, user interface, you can uh, set up uh, risk related, risk management related uh, properties. One of these properties is the likelihood and severity intervals. You can um, 
you can change the intervals, you can add new interval items, and you can remove those items or change the existing items. The same applies for likelihood and severity. In the risk matrix feature, you can, in this page, you can reverse the axis if you want. By default, the horizontal axis is the severity and the vertical axis is the likelihood, but you can reverse it if you want. Uh, and in all of this, uh, in all representations of the risk matrix, uh, the axis will be reverted. And you can define custom colors by clicking on this color palette and then click on the field and you then you click save and then uh, uh, the new color is saved and it means that everywhere in the risk matrices uh, this new color will be applied for this cell. You can set up the color of each cell and this way you can define uh, more ranges than the default because by default we have three ranges of uh, risk we have the high risk range marked with red, we have the medium risk range marked with yellow, and we have the, uh, the low risk, risk or acceptable risk range, which is marked with green. And during the risk management, the goal is that we have to move the items, uh, the risk items from the red zone to the green zone. So that's uh, that's how it is represented, and that's, that these are the things that you can modify in the risk management settings. And now let's see a failure mode item. So uh, in the failure mode and effect analysis for the requirements or um, components of the system, we try to define the possible failure modes and collect them under that uh, system element or system item, we, we try to link the failure modes to the system, uh, system element. And if you uh, uh, look at this uh, page, this is the system requirements page, which contains the elements of the system. In this case, it's a vehicle electrical system. And the failure mode tracker uh, contains the possible failure modes of the items of uh, this system requirements tracker. If we click on power supply as an item of the system requirements tracker, in the risk field we can see the three possible failure modes uh, of this item. So that's how it is linked. And uh, if we uh, just choose a uh, failure mode item, and open the properties of this item, we can see that there are several fields specific to the failure modes. So here, let's see these one by one. We have the failure mode effect. And uh, one more thing, uh, here the different fields are coupled and one field is the string or, or the text representation of the failure mode and the other field is a numeric representation uh, of this failure mode property. For example, we have a failure effects field, which is a text field, and here you can type the text of this failure mode definition, the effects of this failure mode. And in the severity, you can provide a number based on this effects field. So these two are coupled somehow, logically. Uh, we have the failure cause, uh, which is a textual field, and we have an occurrence, uh, which is a numeric field, and these two are related. We have the controls uh, field, it's a textual field, and we have the detection field, which is a numeric field. In the analysis, um, the computations are performed based on the numeric fields, but the human uh, interactions, uh, like considerations and uh, uh, analysis b uh, happens based on the text and the number, the numeric fields. Uh, here, finally, we have, uh, as we provide, as we do the failure mode analysis, we will provide the three numbers, the severity, occurrence, and detection numbers, and the, uh, the, the risk uh, number is computed as the multiplication of the three, at least in this model, 
that this uh, project template follows. Uh, here, uh, the RPN number, the risk uh, result number, is computed as the multiplication of these three numbers. And this, is, uh, this happens automatically. So you don't have to fill this field because it's computed automatically. Uh, you can define further numeric and textual fields here. And you can change the equation of this computation of this RPN field uh, by customizing the tracker and the risk properties of the tracker. Uh, so once you, you uh, define the failure uh, severity occurrence and detection and the textual representation of these. Uh, the status of this uh, failure mode will be new, so it means that it's just defined, and then you can start your mitigation action. So that's the life cycle of this failure mode. The next in this life cycle is that you try to provide a mitigation effort, try to provide a mitigation method for this failure mode. And during this, you record the planned actions. You record your actions in the planned actions field. And uh, depending on this action and your considerations, you provide the severity, occurrence, and detection after the action is taken. And it means that uh, after this uh, action is taken, we will have a new risk uh, value, which is the multiplication of the former tree, and this is also computed automatically. So these are the basic fields of our failure mode. And, uh, uh, and then once you uh, uh, plan uh, these actions, then the failure mode will go to the actions planned status, and when you uh, pro you perform these actions, then the failure mode will go to the actions taken uh, status. So, so much about the failure mode fields and, and workflow. The next uh, feature that we have for failure modes is the failure FMEA worksheet, which is a view in our system. And once you click on this view, you can see here the FMEA worksheet, on which you can see a, a table with all of the important properties of the failure modes. And these are sorted by the status. Uh, this failure mode uh, uh, worksheet uh, can be exported into Word or Excel in the more uh, menu, you can find uh, the link export to Office, and by using this link, you can export this to Office. If you want to create a new failure mode, uh, you simply have to go to the system requirements tracker and uh, choose a requirement, and in the center panel of the requirements document view, there is a plus icon. If you click on this icon, here, a small menu opens, which uh, uh, allows you to create relating items. And one of these relating, I relating items uh, are the risks. And here we have a generate risk link. And if you have several risk trackers or failure mode trackers, you can choose in which tracker you would like to create the risk. And once you click it, it uh, opens uh, the create page. And here you can see all of the fields of the new failure mode. And you can define your failure mode, and automatically it will be linked to the uh, system requirement. OK. In the, in the uh, failure mode tracker document view in the more menu, we have a risk matrix diagram link, which leads us to the risk matrix diagram of this failure mode tracker. This risk matrix diagram is a two-dimensional diagram in which the horizontal axis is or vertical is the severity and the other axis is the likelihood. It can be set up whether it's the horizontal or the vertical. But uh, finally, in this uh, risk matrix, 
each cell represents a likelihood and severity value and you you can see the uh, in the risk approach you can see the risks that are in this likelihood and severity range and by clicking uh, the items in the cells are links and by clicking in the link uh, clicking on the link you can see the risk which is in the cell or the list of risks which are in the cell and the requirements which are related to this risk um, what we can see here is the initial risk matrix it means that this matrix considers only the initial values of likelihood severity and severity and uh, this will uh, uh, represent the initial situation of your risk analysis so your risk mitigation efforts are not considered in this view the second view is the risk matrix after mitigation which considers only the mitigated risks and it represents you the situation after the risk mitigation so here we can see that the, before the risk mitigation we have several uh, we have one item in the red zone which is a uh, risky high risk zone and several items close to the high risk zone and after the risk mitigation effort we have all items only close to the green zone which is a low risk zone so the mitigation effort uh, had some effect on the risks uh, in the risk matrix representation there are two approaches one is the risk based approach which uh, in which the primary uh, uh, entities that we consider are the risks and we uh, find the requirements for the risk. The, the other approach is a requirement based approach in which we collect the requirements and we collect the risks of the requirements and we put the requirements into the cells of the risk matrix. <coughs> if we click on, on, a, on a cell here we can see that there is a list of requirements and in the next column you can see the risk collected for this requirement so these are the two approaches and any approach and any representation of the risk matrix <coughs> you can export them to Word or Excel <coughs> The next feature <coughs> that we will uh, present is the traceability browser. <coughs> Excuse me. So the traceability browser um, provides you a view in which you can collect uh, connect the items of your <coughs> trackers uh, with different relations uh, including associations and, and uh, referencing tracker fields and, uh, and uh, so in the traceability browser for one tracker you can choose another tracker and uh, the result will be a table like structure in which in one column there are the items of the first tracker and the second column contains the relating items of the second tracker so here we open the the traceability browser of the system requirements and now let's see which are the failure modes that are related which are the failure modes that are related to uh, to these system requirements you for this you simply click on the failure modes link and the result will be a two column table in which in the first column there are the system requirements and in the second column the, uh, you can find the failure modes which are related to this uh, requirement <laughs> So, <clears throat> uh, 
here you can see that for, for supply we have three uh, failure modes that are related and uh, uh, the cells of these failure modes are just uh, beside the cell of power supply so that this uh, gives you a good overview about the relations between the trackers and in the traceability browsers in the header you can set, set up several things one thing is if you would like to see associations or uh, referencing tracker fields or both incoming and outgoing references you can exclude the folders and information notes of the trackers. You can copy into the clipboard the permanent link of this current view because these parameters are go going to the uh, uh, URL. And you can manage presets. If, you, if we click on this presets uh, uh, link, we can see in an overlay or uh, previously saved views. We have here one view which is preset 1 and here you can also see that it's the system requirements and, and uh, 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 system requirements um, linking. If you click on load this view will be loaded and if you have another view here you simply click on save current settings and this will go into a preset, a new preset. So that's how it works. Uh, we have also a settings uh, page in which you can set up the traceability browser. Uh, you can control the drag and drop options. In the left uh, panel you can use drag and drop to compose your set of trackers and this uh, and this settings uh, controls this uh, feature. You can control the type of dependencies whether it's they are incoming, outgoing or associations or relations. You can control the possible tracker types and you can also control properties like showing hidden trackers and exclude folders and so on. So this is what you can uh, do to set up the traceability browser. Uh, these are comparatively new uh, developments and uh, these features were developed just recently. And the last thing that I would like to demonstrate is the uh, coverage view of the system requirements in which you can see how much your requirements are covered by test cases. So if you open the document view or other view of your system requirements tracker and you click on more and click on test coverage, uh, the coverage browser will open and this is a tree view in which uh, you can expand uh, the node by left click and expand uh, on any node. So now I expanded one the, uh, the top level node of this system requirements and here you can see a tree a representation of your requirements and the test cases verifying these requirements and the test runs which belong to the test cases. Um, the, value, the coverage values are accumulated from the uh, leave nodes, leaf nodes, to the top level, towards the top level nodes. Uh, it means that, for example, we have this power supply feature or requirement, and for this we have one test case, the power supply test. This test case had one test run, the this run of power supply test. It's a test run somebody has run this test and this test run was passed. It means that the parent item, because this test run was passed, the parent item is also passed and its parent item is also passed because it has only this uh, child and this child is passed. So it means that power supply is passed. If we check on light bulb, another requirement, the light bulb test run was failed, it means that the test was failed, which means that the requirement is failed. So this coverage tablet um, collects uh, the coverage information and gives you a simple representation. And if we, if we uh, just uh, look at the front light lamp, which contains uh, four uh, requirements, and two of these four are not even uh, uh, they are not run, the test uh, case exists but not run, 
So the, their tablet contains incomplete. So incomplete coverage status means that we have test cases for the uh, feature, but it, they were not run yet. <clears throat> and it means that its parent item, the front right lamp, will be also incomplete because there are some test cases which were not run yet. So it means that passing one test run is not enough to change the parent item to pass because uh, it needs all of the test cases to be run. In fact, this rule can be changed by using here the calculate coverage with or option because this the default option is the end option. So it means that in order to have this, this passed, uh, all of the test cases, one and the other and the other and the other must be passed. If we change this to or, it means that if any of these test cases are passed, then the parent item's coverage status is also passed. So you can also define your coverage uh, workflow, your coverage uh, calculation, at least the nature of your coverage calculation, uh, by using this option. And uh, here in the coverage analysis field, it's like a progress bar. Here you can see the accumulated values about how many test cases uh, are there for this item and how many of them are passed, uh, failed, blocked or not run. So you can see these accumulated values also here. And uh, so we have this, this tree and in the header we have several options that I will explain to you. First is you can filter your tree by a keyword, search keyword, and you can choose whether the keyword applies to the work items or the test cases, or both. You can also show the colors of the, your work item groups. You can uh, change this calculate coverage with OR that I explained just some minutes before. And you can also hide the incomplete items. This is uh, what you can control in the header. Beyond this, on this page we have the test coverage statistics in which uh, we provide statistical information about this tree and the status of requirements. Here you can see how many of the requirements are passed in a certain tracker. If there are several trackers, each tracker will be a, a row here. And in the bottom, the, the last row is the totals. Here you can see also the same in percentages and uh, also the not covered items, also the covered and the total. So pretty much you can see everything that you could, uh, that you possibly need, all the information. So this is the header, the, the statistics tab, and now let's see the filter tab. You can also filter this uh, coverage tree in a very sophisticated way. So you can filter it by the coverage, so the, the item you would like to see for example the items that are covered or not covered but you can also choose some specific coverage status like past failed blocked or other coverage status you can also fil uh, filter this view by the statuses of of the trackers that compose this view so here you can see each tracker and for each tracker each status and you can filter for their statuses you can filter by tracker. You can disable and enable trackers in this view. You can filter by feature stability. And feature stability means that the last 10, uh, a feature is stable if the last 10 runs, test runs, were all passed for this feature. So the, for example, the requirement has several test cases. Uh, all of the test cases must have 10 successful test runs in order to be qualified as stable feature. And you can filter based on this also. Uh, you can filter by test configuration, running interval, so you can define which date your test runs uh, were run. You can define the dates, a date range. You can define which tester has uh, performed the test runs. You can choose the testers and filter based on the testers. and you can also control the number of recent test runs shown because uh, theoretically for one test case there can be thousands of test runs and 
uh, it's uh, it varies uh, largely uh, which one you would like to see or which range of test runs you would like to see so you can control them also in this filter so there is a very sophisticated filter for this test coverage and uh, this was the live demo thank you very much for your attention and I would like to give back the a presentation to my colleague. Thank you, Chandler, for the demonstration. And before we move on to um, the uh, questions and answer session, there is one last question that I would like to ask you, and I promise this is the last one that we're going to be asking over, over to your questions. So whether or not you would like to receive further information about CodeBeamer, now that you have seen uh, what it's capable of in terms of uh, risks. Right. And in the meantime, let's check what questions uh, you were asking us. Okay. Thank you for, for your responses. Uh, first of all, there's one question about fault tree analysis. Um, while CodeBeamer does not support uh, fault tree analysis per se, it um, allows you to import uh, mapped fault tree diagrams. So it has integration with Enterprise Architect, which means that if you can create your um, fault trees there, you can import those as uh, images to Goldbeamer. Is there also a risk graph for safety risks for three or more dimensions? Uh, currently, Goldbeamer does not offer uh, a graph for three or more dimensions. Uh, Ashandor, I think the next question is going to be yours. Is it possible to have different look of editable automatic calculate fields? I'm not sure if I understand. This uh, if the question, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. If the question is uh, about the editor of the automatic calculation in the in the in the tracker configuration. For each field, there is a calculate field in which you can type in the calculate uh, the equation itself. There is an equation language which we use, and uh, you can um, and you can uh, type in the, the 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 equation. So this is one view. So that's that's the that's the layout that we provide. I'm not sure I understood the question perfectly. Yeah, so basically you can change the equation and the, the name of the field as well, and practically everything you can customize. Hopefully these Yes, you can create new question. fields. Yeah, you can create new fields. You can refer to these fields into the equation, in the equation. Yes. And you can change the equation good. itself too. Okay, and then we have one more uh, question. Is, is it possible to generate the failure mode independent from requirements for general failure mode? Yes, that is, uh, there is a possibility. You can just uh, create failure modes independently from any requirement. For general failure mode, can look to reuse. Oh, okay. Chandra, I think the question here is whether or not you can reuse uh, failure modes or risks in other projects. Uh, where is this question? It's the fourth question. Fourth is the in the catalog to reuse. Um, uh, reusing failure modes. Uh, uh, I think currently it's not possible, but there can be workarounds to do to provide this reuse feature. We, for test cases and requirements, we have a, 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 an explicit reuse feature, which is articulated also on the user interface. But for failure modes, we don't have this explicit feature, but I'm sure we can provide a workaround to, to use, uh, to reuse the failure modes. Yeah, so if this is something for you example, need, it can be done. Yes, in the user interface we have a copy to feature in which you can copy to any project, any tracker. This can be some kind of reuse, but explicit reuse we don't have yet. Right, 
Do we have any more questions? Sorry, there you go. It seems like there are no more questions. So thank you so much for your attention. It seems like we have, um, well, this has been a long webinar. <laughs> we have passed our time a little bit, but hopefully it has been valuable for all of you. So uh, once again, please feel free to visit our webinars and events page and sign up for any of our future events. And we look forward to meeting you at uh, either our conferences, trade shows, or our next webinar on the 24th of February. Thank you once again for being here. Goodbye.